Thank you and welcome everyone. So I started off by a few months ago, I met up with a friend and he was a little bit frustrated and I just had a conversation with him to try to figure out what the problem was. So, you know, he's, he's a smart guy, he's a coder, been up and down Silicon Valley with a lot of great companies, but it seemed like every year, year and a half, he would switch jobs. So I wanted to figure out a little bit more, you know, why is he frustrated? And when I spoke with him, what I learned is, well, he felt like he didn't really have a voice in his company, that he proposed multiple projects he wanted to work on. They said okay, but never went anywhere. He got a little bit bored on what he was doing. Um, but at the end of the day, he was just frustrated that he didn't have a voice, that nobody would pay attention to his expertise, even though he was incredibly smart and had great ideas. So I went to see, okay, well, I, I sat down with him and said, how did you talk to your boss? And he said, well, I just told him I was frustrated and I told him I wanted to work on a project and, you know, that was pretty much it. And I said, well, okay, but did you connect your project to the company mission and show how it's aligned? No. Did you show that it was, you know, able to save money for what you're looking to do or increase customer satisfaction? No. Okay, so we sat down, had a conversation. I went through you know, a variety of different things I've learned across multiple companies that I've worked with over the, day, over the years. Um, and it turns out he met back with his boss and everything went well. He actually was able to work on his project. He stayed with the company and was able to actually feel like he had a voice at that point. So one thing I learned is, you know, if there is a way to provide some type of framework or something that other people can use in order to know here's how you communicate with the business in terms that they'll understand, you know, let's put that together. So the presentation's about that. So the first part is, are you happy at your job? You know, based on a ISACA state of cybersecurity report for last year, this is what we found from a cyber professional perspective. 54% say poor financial incentives. 48% say limited promotion or development opportunities. And 43 said high work stress levels. So based on these stats, I'm guessing that everyone in here can relate to at least one of these. And it seemed to be this isn't just a problem with a friend of mine, this is a problem that is widespread. So let's do something about it. So let me take a step back and introduce myself. My name is Nicole Mendelera. Um, I've worked in cyber for a couple of decades now. I worked at a large consulting firm, Ernst & Young. Started out in the risk and assurance practice doing things like business continuity, um, IT audits, just a variety of different things. And about two or three years into it, they built out their security practice. So I moved over to security and helped them build out their security program management. And security program management ultimately means is going into a company, assessing their security program, identifying areas of improvement, figuring out where they want to go on their goals, and providing a roadmap how to get there. And many times helping with the implementation of that. So I've done that for many years, worked with over 100 Fortune 500 companies, worked with small and medium-sized companies. So what I've been able to do is have the opportunity to see what works well at other companies and what doesn't. And regardless of the culture, regardless of the people, regardless of the industry, what are the commonalities that I'm seeing? And that's what I built this framework on. So why am I here? I'm here to share my knowledge. You know, I, I know I have a great experience across multiple companies. Many people in their life have only worked with a few companies, two or three. Um, so I'm here to bring a perspective, you know, that works across multiple industries and multiple companies. Things that, that will work regardless of what your job is, where you're at, uh, what the company culture is like. This is supposed to work across all of it. Now, it's not foolproof. At the end of the day, it's not going to work for everyone all the time. But it's about what things will set you up for the most success. Sometimes you just have an asshole for a boss just the way it is, not much you can do about that. But in general, these are things that will improve your chance to have these thoughtful conversations with your boss, with management, with whoever you're having a conversation with. One other thing, uh, this is my first public speaking, so be nice to me. So <laughs> thank you very much for that, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. So, what are the benefits to demonstrating the value of your work and the value of you, the value you bring to a company? So, from a your work perspective, there's funding, approval, protection, and action. And what that ultimately means is, 
when you're building something, whether you're a coder and you're building a program or whatever the case is, you want to make sure that you do have a voice. And one of the benefits of being able to demonstrate the value of your work is having that voice. And what that means is things like, hey, I, I see a vulnerability I've identified. We don't have the budget or time to stop because we have deadlines. We really need to address this. And instead of getting brushed off by management saying we can't, it's having that voice and being able to communicate why it's so important that they need to stop what they're doing to actually focus on it. So it's, it's being able to protect the public and your customers. It's being able to get management to take whatever action is needed um, and really just allowing your work to speak for itself. On the other hand, it's really showing the value that you bring to the company also. So what does that do beneficial-wise? It helps you grow. So it could be things like career growth and promotions. It could be selectively being able to work on more projects. Because we all know if the company values you, they're willing to do things and be flexible to keep you around. And that means being able to work on other projects, possibly. It might mean a work, work flex schedule, whatever the case is. And last but not least is job security. So as we all know, and I'll go through this a little bit later, you know, a lot of people are being laid off in our area over the past year. That's not stopping at this point. So making sure that you are showing your value so that you are able to stay at your job if that's what you choose to do, or get a new job if you choose not to. So unheard voices that impact your career. So based on the stats, the top three, the poor financial incentives, limited promotions, and high stress levels. And for high stress levels, what ultimately that means, um, based on the survey data that I looked through, they're really talking about things like it's hard to make deadlines, like the deadlines are really stressful because some people were laid off or they didn't hire enough qualified people, they have to take on more. So now they're taking on the job responsibilities of one and a half people or two people. Right? A lot of that does create a high stress environment and that's part of what's been here. You know, the solution for, for all of it or things that can help that is demonstrating the value of your work in you. So now let's focus on your work part of this. So can you guess this breach? I'm going to give some clues and I want to see if anyone can guess it. It's a pretty obvious one, so we'll see. So in 2017, a global ransomware attack impacted millions of people. I know, great timing, right? Well, as we work on that, I'll give you some of the details. So at the end of the day, it was a 2017 ransomware attack that impacted companies across the globe. Millions of people were impacted, including NHS, which is a national health service uh, based in the UK. What ended up happening is um, they ended up having to reroute some of their emergency patients because the systems were down. They could not take patients. They rerouted them. Uh, any elective surgery was canceled. And on top of that, cancer patients actually could not get chemo. So this is a huge impact to people. Um, it, it cost people their lives. And what is the cause of it? It was an unpatched vulnerability. At the end of the day, the vulnerability patch was out there. Microsoft offered it about 12 months before this happened. And you know, in this case, the health system knew about it. Uh, they had conversations about it, but it was not prioritized because people were not able to show why is this urgent and why is this important until it's too late, until can, there's an impact. Can you log in here? I hit the button on the side, sorry. That's okay. So can anyone tell me what the breach is? 2017, huge. Wanna cry? Yes, thank you very much. Wanna cry. It's froze.
There we go. Now we can clap. So the, the WannaCry breach, um, you know, cost NHS 92 million pounds. Uh, impacted over 19,000 people where, where their appointments were canceled. They had to get rerouted. You know, it, it caused, you know, unfortunately, deaths. So it's critical to, to make sure that you're hearing, you know, the voice of the business. So I have a quick poll. Whose fault is it? Whose fault was the breach? Whose fault is a breach? Business executives who failed to protect. Security teams who failed to actually speak up and, and be able to communicate properly. Vendors who release the software with the vulnerabilities or the government or regulatory bodies for not holding companies accountable. So raise a hands uh, for number one, business executives who thinks it's their fault. Wow, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Security teams who thinks it's their fault. Okay. Vendors. Okay. And last but not least, the government. I, know, I purposely chose not to because everyone's going to choose it. I want to force you to choose. So as we continue, I'm just going to keep going. Um, so benefits that you have as far as you personally, uh, so your work speaking is part of it, but also you being able to speak um, highly of yourself and show growth potential and things like that, that's pretty critical also. So, you know, in 2023 last year, ISC Squared did a survey for cyber workforce study. The top three reasons why people enter into the profession, number one is career opportunities and growth. Number two is stimulating work and being able to work on the projects that they want. And three is appreciation, so raises and recognition. So if you haven't drawn the parallel, that's pretty comparable to what we just talked about the benefits being. On top of that, the last one is job security. So from a job security perspective, um, in last year, some of the big stats that we're seeing is 47% have been impacted and dealt with cutbacks to their team. And this is specific for cyber folks. This is not IT across the board or everyone. This is only cyber. 22 experienced layoffs. And then coming this year, 2024, 20, 31% of the teams are expected to have additional cutbacks. So this is becoming more and more critical right now, given the state of our economy. So next poll, what resonates the most with you? Growth, I'm sorry, career growth, appreciation, stimulating work, or job security? So those that say career growth, okay. Appreciation, okay. Stimulating work, ah, that's a big one, okay. Almost everyone raised their hand for that. And job security. Interesting. Very few people. Okay. So people want to be, you know, stimulated more than they want their job. <laughs> Which is not a huge surprise. I mean, we come into this business because it's exciting, right? So to work a dead-end, boring job isn't a whole lot of fun. I think it's telling that work-life balance is on none of these lists. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. So I'm going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes teaching you about the framework, um, but pay attention because the remaining amount of time we're going to do a case study together. I have fake materials I put up, LinkedIn profiles and everything else, and I want to see can we pick out the things to be able to create a message for you. So from a framework perspective, you know, I broke it down into five different areas. The first is de determine your messaging. What is the message you're trying to communicate? Research your audience, so know your audience, whether it's your boss or someone you've never met before. It's understanding what's going to resonate with them. It's translating tech into the business, and I do have slides to support each one of these and go into details, especially the two that have to do with translating. Uh, craft your story, so what is the story that you're trying to tell? And then prepare counterpoints, so in the event that they say, well, we don't have a budget for it, or we don't have the people for it, what are some of the counterpoints that you're going to do? So determine messaging. For, so from a messaging perspective, making sure that you're clear on yourself what your objectives are. What action do you want them to take? Do you want them to give you a raise? Do you want them to do nothing and just listen and learn so you'll come back next time and say some other action? 
Do you want them to say, I want you to go to management and get support for this or funding for this? You want to be very clear and very direct in this regards what you actually want to communicate and what you're asking for. Research your audience. So understanding what's important to your audience really helps you craft that message. Right? There's a lot of different things you can do. You can look through LinkedIn, other social media. I'll look through blogs. I'll, I'll listen to podcasts about the people. Half the people I meet I've never met before, but by the time I meet them, I know as much as I possibly can about them. Very good at LinkedIn stalking. Um, and, and that's a good thing, right? Now I know what's going to resonate for them. I know what's important to them. I know what they've talked on in the past and where their knowledge is, at least as much as I can get. It's never going to be perfect, but at least you can make some estimated determinations based on what you're seeing. So some of the questions to ask yourself is, what previous knowledge and experience do they have on the topic? Are they brand new and you have to give an intro, or can you just kind of jump into the middle of it because they'll understand? What motivates them, goals or KPIs? And what is their communication style? So, some points to figure out how do you actually incorporate your research into messaging. Number one is, are they in, in a financial situation where they play a financial role? Or if you look on their LinkedIn profile and you see a lot of numbers, that tells me they're analytical. If they're analytical, that means that you need to provide them with quantified data. So it's not about, hey, we're going to save jobs. It's about, based on you know, us buying this tool that I need in order to do coding, we're going to save 40 hours of developer time. That translates into 20 grand. We'll pay for the tool within two years. So someone that's more financial, more analytical, you want to quantify your response to them. That is what they're looking for. If they are a business leader advisor, some things to look for there, maybe they're consultants. Those are some key words advisor, um, maybe they're an executive, anyone director and above I put in this bucket. So what are the things you communicate with them there? You communicate, first of all, the holistic view. They don't want to get into the nitty gritty. They're not looking for that. That's not their role. That's not their job. They want to understand how does your ask fall into the bigger picture of things? Is it aligned to the company values and mission? Right? You don't want to go too much into the detail. If they want the detail, they'll ask. But start off with a holistic picture. 99% of the time you go into details, you will lose them. This is the type of person you will lose, and they will drown you out and pretend to stare at the wall when you speak if you go into too many details without them understanding first. The next is people-oriented. So people-oriented could be, maybe you'll find um, in their experience, you'll see customer success folks, or maybe their write-up will be, you know, I want to make my patients, you know, the best experience they can have. People that you see, say, um, attribute their success to their teams. They'll say, yeah, I led a team, but my team is the one that did X, Y, and Z. They're people-oriented. They're focused on that. Then you want to actually make sure when you build your case for them, you're focused on that. It's not about the money. It's not about the dollars. It's about the people. How are you showing that your, your ask is going to motivate the team more? How are you showing it's going to impact your customers? Those are the types of things you pick up for when you research and you see that they're more people-oriented. Or they do volunteer work. That also tells me they're, they're people-oriented. Uh, the innovative or creative people. So if you see the word innovation, if you see best in class, if you see think outside the box, those are all keys telling me they're innovative or creative. So how do you resonate with them? What you do is you, you sell the vision. You sell the dream. It's not about here and now. It's not about holistic picture. It's about here's how it could be. In a perfect world, here's how it could be. Because these people are dreamers, right? And they want to know what is your dream for this? Where is this going to go beyond just one small thing? And last but not least, least is your um, person who is an influencer or your person who does personal achievements. These are ones, when you look into the profile, there's a lot of I statements. There's a lot of, I did this, I did that. It's not team focused, it's focused on them. It's really them centric. How do you resonate with them is exactly what you think it would be. You say, how is this going to impact you? So for instance, a good example of that is, hey, you know, if we're able to do this project, you, you, when you meet with your boss next month, you can actually display it and show how we you know, whatever we did, whether we accomplished something or didn't accomplish something, but it's about setting them up to succeed because that's what they're looking to do. 
It's understanding what are the KPIs that they have, how are they getting promoted, and elevating them in this case. So that's where we're at from a know your audience perspective. The next one is translating tech into business. Absolutely. Chances are it would be the case. I mean, if you're a financial executive, you hit business and financial, right? So there's no reason why you can't do both. So in that case, I don't see why you can't quantify data and give them some statistics. But before going into that, let's show them the holistic view, right? So it's not going to be uncommon for, you know, someone to fall into multiple buckets. Just make sure you address all of them, right? What you're probably not going to see is you're not going to see a people-oriented and an influencer. You're not going to see ones that contrast. You got it. You nailed it. That's exactly it. Very, very similar. There's a lot of different studies that support a lot of this. It's about how do we take it in our industry based on what we do and apply it. Absolutely. So how do you translate tech into the business? Demonstrating how your ask either increases revenue or decreases risk. At the end of the day, businesses do two things. Increase revenue, decrease risk. They do not care about anything else. That is it. I've worked with dozens of boards of directors. I've worked with hundreds of executives. I have not found a single one who does things differently than that. There might be other things like, hey, we care about our patients and clients and stuff like that. That's absolutely true. But these two are true regardless of the company. So when translating tech into the business, think about that every single time. That should be in the back of your mind. For decreasing risk, I understand the increase in revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you quantify it, that's what it is. So instead of just saying nothing's happening, what you do say is a lot of times companies will have to go through risk assessments at least once a year. Most of your compliance regulations require it. So PCI, just a variety, if you're doing like a SOC 2, just a variety of compliance things, almost all companies will do a risk assessment and at the end they should have a score. If you're doing your job and if the vulnerabilities are being met, that score will continue to go up and your maturity of the organization will continue to go up. So the best way to show decrease of risk is actually quantifying it. Here's your baseline, here's your starting point, and here's the progress we've made against it. If you could put numbers to it, absolutely do it. Um, there's also things that, you know, there's tools out there right now and, and methodologies out there that actually will do risk quantification. So what they do is they will take stats from like insurance claims, so companies that make insurance claims based on breaches, and they'll say, okay, well, Based on your environment, similar companies usually will get breached once every four years, and as a result, the breach will cost $350 million. These tools will, are actually designed to show that and quantify that risk for you. So when you actually implement a control to mitigate that risk, it will show a reduction. Either a reduction in the likelihood or reduction of the impact if something were to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, and that's where revenue increase comes in. Like, if you're a company that makes products, if you're a small company, you could probably wing it and you could probably answer all the questionnaires that your customers have. But once you grow a little bit, there's no way you're going to answer 350 million questions. So what companies will do is they'll issue a SOC 2. And what a SOC 2 ultimately means is you'll have auditors come in, assess your security practice, and then give you a write-up saying it's secure, that people can actually trust it. So that's the way that they really focus on that. Any other questions? So how? How do we do this? I know I just talked through a little bit, some of them, but here's some additional ones. So communicate revenue and risk based on cost and hour savings, or as we mentioned, quantifying risk. Alignment with the company or your audience's personal goals is always important. This is a big one. This next one people overlook, but this is probably a pretty key one I've learned after decades. And it only came more recent. 
It's tying things to compliance. When it comes to budget, compliance always gets priority. Because if you're not compliant, and what I mean by compliance, it could be the SOC 2 that we just spoke about. You're not compliant with that, you don't get customers. It could be something like PCI for, for companies that actually take credit card information. If you're not compliant with that, you can't sell, right? So most companies have some compliance regulations. If you're operating in Europe, you have to be GDPR, which is a privacy regulation, compliant. Companies are not willing to you know, be non-compliant. They're willing to spend money on it. So if you can say, hey, listen, I want this scanning tool. It'll help me with my job, but it will also decrease our vulnerabilities, which is needed for PCI. If you can put it into that bucket, you will get the funding for it. Otherwise, you have to fight for funding outside of that bucket. So if you can, this is a pretty key one for people in order to get the funding to do what you're trying to do. Demonstrate what happens if no action is taken. This is an easy one. We have so many breaches that are public, right? So if you tie it back to a breach that's public specifically to what you're looking to do, a, a specific vulnerability, um, that's a good one. It, I would tie it back to whatever impact you can uh, hey, I worked at a different company and this is what happened and here's the results of it. So even if it's a personal story, that's okay too. They just need to understand if they're not taking action, here's what may happen. And it's not about scaring people, it's about showing consequences. So we're not trying to scare people into things. We're trying to say, listen, logically, if we're not able to do this, here's your risk. If you choose to, to you know, be okay with it, fine. But I'm making them aware this is the problem and this is the risk. So like after the fact saying you guys have actually impacted another company as a result? I do. And, and we use that a lot for the board of directors. We say, listen, because they always ask, hey, we just saw this headline. Is it, are we at risk for this? We're not, and here's why. Or yes, everyone's at risk for it, but we're a lot less at risk than most people, and here's why. Here's what we've done. So absolutely, a big part of communication is showing progress, and that's to your management and your board. Any other questions so far? Um, ask for their help or advice. This is always a good one. So the easiest way to get someone on your team is to say, hey, listen, here's what I want to do. I'm not sure how to approach it. Can you help me come up with an idea? Automatically, you almost convince them to be on your team. Now, if it's a really stupid idea, maybe not. But in general, they're going to be like, okay, let's brainstorm. Let's figure out how to make this work. So now you have someone on your team before you even got started. So go to them. Ask for advice is certainly a good one. And then if the topic is new to somebody, use analogies if you can. So make it something that they can relate to. Um, it's hard to start from scratch with things. So if you can say, hey, this is exactly how it works in this way, based on their experience, that's what you're going to want to do. Other questions on the translate tech into business? OK. Craft your story. So this one is actually very specific when it comes to the order of things. That's what we pay attention to. So a lot of the elements we went through already, how do you organize them into a story form? I'm sure there's multiple ways, but this is what I found most successfully works for me so far. Number one is, why is this important to the audience? You don't start with your ask, right? If you start with your ask, what ends up happening is people have already made a decision. If I say, hey, listen, the sky is pink, everyone in this room is going to say, no, it's not. You've already made a determination before I can even tell you why I think that. If I start off by saying, hey, it's important to know that you know, the sky is important for X, Y, and Z, and I love to watch sunsets, and when the sun comes in, it shows beautiful colors of, of red and pink and orange and yellow, now you got them on your side because you didn't have your ask right away. They didn't make that assumption right off the bat without you convincing them first. So number one is, why is this important? Because otherwise they're not going to pay attention. How is it aligned to business success? So again, 
It's really focused on teeing it up so they understand why it's important before you even tell them what the idea is. The consequences of not taking action, and then only then is where we start number four, which is where you actually tell them your ask. At that point, very direct. I would be very direct about it. You want to be very clear about it. You don't want them to walk away saying, we had a great conversation, but what happens now? You want to make sure that you're covering all your bases there. Why you chose that over other alternatives. So the next question they're going to have in their head is, okay, well, you want to do it this way. You want this scanning tool, but there's 800 of them. Why did you decide that? So showing here's the alternatives and here's why I chose this will be pretty important. And then last but not least, what action do you want them to take? So every time I present it, there's always the next steps. What is the next step in this? It's not just, hey, we had a great conversation, let's leave. It's we will be held accountable for the next steps here. Here's what they are. Whether it's you need to talk to management about a budget or it's, you know, I, I, I'd love to have another person on the team and here's how we do it. Or, you know, can we meet with vendors in order to figure out the tools we need? Whatever the case is, making sure you make that clear. Questions on this one? So here's some tips. Don't just be data driven. I'm an analytical person, I love my data, but you can't just throw data at people. You have to tell a story. Everyone can interpret data in 50 different ways. You don't want them to think. You want to connect the dots for them. Make it as easy as possible what your data is actually showing. You want to consistently keep your key message in mind and your person in mind. It's great to say, hey, I'm doing this because I want to make sure our customers have a better experience, but an hour later, they completely forgot what you're talking about. So make sure that they, they're aware, tie it back to the customer every single time if it's a customer-focused person, right? It's not just one time in the talk. And then communicate your message in headers. I, I learned this, and this is interesting. So whether you do a presentation or maybe you're preparing and you have an outline, what I always do is I start with the headers of slides, and that is my story. I create my story through that. Once I nail the story and I know where I'm going with this, then I'll build the details, right? So making sure you nail the story and here's the key points I want to focus on, uh, that helps a lot because a lot of people struggle with knowing where to start and there's so much data they want to communicate, they get a little overwhelmed. This helps with that. This helps with saying just straight up bluntly, here's what I want to do, here's the reason we're doing it, here's the importance of it, Document it out, and then you can start building out points in regards to each one. Prepare for counterpoints. So this is the last part of the framework. Proactively address questions that you know are going to happen. Right? If you know that your boss is really conscious when it comes to uh, budget, address it. Just say, hey, listen, I know that this costs money. I'm in the process of building a business case. I'd love to get your thoughts on so that we can go for some of the discretionary funding that's available. Right? You want to make sure that you're proactively addressing and thinking through what objections might they have so that you can proactively do it. Same thing with questions. You know there's probably going to be questions, which questions you think they're going to ask. Well, part of that is based on knowing your audience, right? If they're analytical, what is the cost? What is the, what is the return on investment? You already kind of have a sense, even if you've never even met the person, what they're going to be looking for. Make sure you can either address it proactively or you can answer questions that come up. So questions so far, that's the framework. The next part is the case study. So before I go into that, I want to pause for a minute, see if there's questions or any clarification that people need. Okay, thank you. All right, here's a case study. So let me read this to you real quick. We'll skip around a little bit. But we're going to do a case study. I'm then going to give you materials, and I want your help picking out the details of the materials to figure out how to craft your message. So the case study, you are a lead security engineer at a healthcare company doing home healthcare services. Your company handles sensitive data and you play a critical role in ensuring the organization successfully protects their patients. Your team recently took over responsibility for the company's website and one of your engineers performed a review of the site and they uncovered a critical cross-site scripting vulnerability within the company's patient portal. Exploiting this vulnerability could allow attackers to inject malicious scripts into web pages viewed by others, leading to session hijacking, data theft, and other malicious activities. To mitigate this, you want to implement 
input validation and output encoding to properly sanitize user supplied data. Upon presenting your findings to management, you encounter skepticism about what the severity of the vulnerability is and are waved off and told that you don't need to be prioritizing this, you need to prioritize your own current projects. How do you make your case? So here's the first piece of data. It is a fake profile that I made from LinkedIn. I'm gonna do the first one and then I hope that people volunteer to do the rest. So for me, the first thing that stands out is I wanna know my audience. I look at their history, I see senior customer success lead, I see customer experience manager, I see that the very first statement about us is in my role, blah, 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 well-being of our clients. This tells me this is a people-oriented person. I want to tell what? I want to tell a story to them. I want to ap appeal to the customers or the patients. That's the way I'm going to get them. Is there any other clues on here that people can pick out to say, here's how I'm going to message things? First person eyes, okay. Okay, Duke alumni. Yes, yep. A lot of collaboration, so you want to do what? You want to incorporate the team. You want to show how this is going to impact your team, not just the person, not just the company, but they're going to be focused on elevating their team and being part of it. Anything else on here? I, I, I love using people's words against them. So when they say, you know, I want, I'm strive for operational excellence, I say, okay, well, I know that that's important to you. One part of doing so is X, Y, and Z. You almost put them in a box where it's like, you said that you, you, you really strive for this. This is one way to do it. You turn it down, you're really going against what you said. So great, great pick. The next material is an expert excerpt from a company plan. So you have enhanced patient experience, expansion, service, expansion of service offerings, your security enhancement, and then at the bottom, it starts to talk about as we expand our service offerings, we anticipate our net profit to increase by 15% and by increasing our average billable per patient by 12 grand and increasing our customer base by 2,500. What does this tell you? What can you take from here that can help you with your messaging? Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, from a growth perspective, if they want to grow, it's connecting back with the specific growth areas. So, I mean, this one, we kind of threw you a little bit of a softball here because it actually says security enhancement. Most will not say that. Most will be more focused on, you know, expansion into other countries or expansion of service offerings, you know, enhanced patient experience. So, you know, as part of the growth, you want to make sure, oh, I know we're planning to grow. We need to be GDPR compliant. Here's how it connects with it, right? Anything else people see in here? Okay, numbers. So how do we show that what we want will actually be consistent with those numbers down there? If they're saying they want to expand their offerings and they want to increase their billable, how are we showing that that's the case so that we can hit this target? Perfect, great, absolutely. So in the event there is a breach, you will lose your customer trust. Everything is based on trust and they're saying that they want their patient experience and their patients do trust them. So that goes absolutely against that. Any other messaging we can do based on what you're seeing up here? Absolutely. How are we going to grow? How are you going to hit our targets if there's a breach that sets us back? We're never going to make up for that. Anything else? Okay. Last piece of data. News article. XSS flaw exposed eWay users to phishing attacks. What does this tell you and how can you use this?
Okay, so in the event that this actually happens to you, right, so using somebody else's to show that this is applicable, it does happen, it's not just theory, it actually does happen to competitors or similar companies, we don't want this to happen to us, right? Anything else people get out of this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Any last one? So it, it, it talks about how dangerous it is to the victims because they don't really suspect that it's happening. And so that goes back into the trust. They're trusting the company and you are protecting them because they're not going to know. Yeah. There, there's a variety of reasons that people get into security. Sometimes you just like the puzzle. Sometimes you like the... I don't want to say conflict, but almost like um, a game, I want to say, where you're trying to outthink somebody else. Uh, for me, I actually got into cyber because I think about my parents. And when I think about them, I think about how hard they've worked their whole life to get a life saving so they can actually retire. And what happens is when companies go through breaches and that information is released, they are now more susceptible to phishing attacks because now you have specific information about them. If your bank is breached, you now know possibly a, their bank account number, right? So when somebody calls and says, I'm your bank, oh, I even know your number, you're more likely to fall for it, right? So for me, it is all about personal. It is all about protecting the public. Great idea, absolutely. Uh, to your earlier point, I think because it's a medical company, you can tie this back to the implications on HIPAA. Absolutely. So if you're not HIPAA compliant, what happens? Can you still operate? Probably not. Even if they don't shut you down, patients are not going to come there. It's not going to happen. If you can't protect my data, how am I going to trust you with my life? Not happening. Mm -hmm. So put that together. Put the customer success part of the LinkedIn profile with what we're seeing here to make an even stronger case on patients. Absolutely. Anything else for any of the three that we saw? And there's no right answers. I mean, I don't even know the answer. Right? I could pick out some of them, but everyone's going to see this differently. Right? So that's why I love people saying this is what I see when I see it. Anything else people want to add? Yep, absolutely. What would happen if it is? What is the damage we would have? It'll probably be a press release or something as well that identifies which different cloud providers they're using and then you can link back to the, you know, the operational efficiency goes out the window as soon as IR guys checks on each release server. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Put your company name there. It makes it very, very real at this point. Because now it's not just theoretical. You just saw a company who fa faced it. And what is it really going to look like if your company name is in there? How are people going to react to it? How are our customers going to react to it? Anything else? Or anyone else have a way that, you know, based on the framework that we've gone through, anyone else have a way that's worked really well over the years? Um, that they've used to be able to communicate the value of what their work is doing or communicate the value of them as a company. Does anyone have suggestions or tips that I haven't included?
Absolutely. Great point. Very good point. Okay. lot of people fell for it? 42%. Wow. 42%. First of all, that means you really nailed that spearfishing. Yeah. But also, it means let's increase the awareness. Let's do some additional training because half your company needs it and the other half probably didn't even see the email. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So to wrap things up, uh, two things. Number one is I do have a, a detailed handout. Obviously, I went through a lot of data. Um, here's a handout of the framework. If you think it would be helpful, come up to me after. I'll be in the hall. Happy to hand them out. Uh, after the conference, I will post it online. Um, so there'll be a code or something you can use in order to get it. Um, but it, it just helps. It helps to have something in front of you. We've gone through a lot. And then last but not least, here's my contact info. Um, I'm offering complimentary practice sessions. And let me just be very blunt about this. This is not a sales pitch. I do not do this as a living. This is not part of my company or what I do. It's a matter of if you have a specific situation you want to practice, let's do it. Because what I'm trying to do also is learn and have more technical conversations. So it will help me have more technical conversations and help you to build a business case for what you're trying to do. So I'll be here for the conference the whole time. Um, shoot me a note, text me, don't call me, I will never pick up. I don't care who you are. Text me or, or find me in the hall somewhere and I'm happy to set up some time. Thank you.